Joining me on the podcast this week is author Evan Ponstingle, who is getting ready to release uh, his first book. Correct, Evan? Yes, that is correct. The book is entitled King's Island, A Ride Through Time. Uh, it's from Rivershore Press. Uh, but welcome to the podcast, Evan. Evan, how's it going? It's been going great. Thanks for having me on, Andrew. Absolutely. So I guess, I mean, writing a book about King's Island, I want to get right into it. I mean, what is your... Mm -hmm. What is your personal history with King's Island as a park? And, you know, how did you decide that you wanted to write a book about King's Island? Yeah, so I moved to Mason um, when I was four years old. So I've been coming to King's Island since I was four years old. I've been a pass holder. Um, and then in, t in October of 2017 was when I started working at the park. I started working in merchandise. And one of the questions that I was getting the most often from guests, actually, is do you sell any books about the history of King's Island? And nobody had ever written one. I mean, you know, we didn't sell any. Um, and I thought that this was a gap that needed to be filled. You go up to Cedar Point, there's tons of Cedar Point history books. Carowinds is a history book. King's Dominion has a book. The Disney parks have tons. Of, I mean, they have entire publishing companies dedicated to publishing Disney history books. King's Island, there's nothing. And the park has such an interesting history. So with the, all the feedback from guests, I started thinking about it. I had always wanted to see one. And I said, you know what? I can definitely do this. So yeah, I decided to write the first ever King's Island history book. So give the guests what they want. I, I hear you. I mean, and I'm not, I'm not going to crack on your age at all, but you're like a high school senior right now. That so is I correct. Mean, yes. Writing a book like coming up with the idea to write a book at that age, and this is coming from somebody who minored in creative writing in college, it's not something you you come to easily. So, you know, what was it that kind of, you got this, this wild hair, so to speak, of I'm going to write a book. I mean, did you have a background in writing? Have What's your, what's your history there? Yeah, I, I enjoy writing. I was good at it. I've always been a huge reader. I love reading. Um, I had written books in you know i'm saying that in quotation marks before mm -hmm. nothing to this scale you know just kind of like personal passion project type things to be quite honest with you so i knew i could do it you know i was getting good grades in english and writing and you know the teacher said oh you're a good writer you're a strong writer so i definitely knew i could do it um i took a class in eighth grade i took mason in the middle which was the middle school a student newspaper and I really enjoyed that class. I got to write a great story about Mystic Timbers because that was the year that Mystic Timbers opened. And I was like, yes, I love writing about Kings Island. I love this style of interviewing people. Um, so, you know, once people started asking about it, I, I knew I was capable of doing it and I knew I could do it well. So I was like, let's get on it, you know, let's do it. Okay. When did you first like start like concepting and being like, this is what I want in a, a book? Like when did this kind of first begin approximately? So this, the idea happened in late July, early August of 2018 was when I had been getting the question throughout the season. And then I went to Cedar Point for the first time in a long time in mid July, 2018. And I saw all the books that they have for sale at, at, in their gift shops. Mm -hmm. So that was the idea, but I didn't really act on it. It was, you know, something I wanted to do. It was stewing in my mind. Um, I was, I was very involved in my high school marching band, which is a long season. And I thought, you know what, I, I thought, let's, let's get that done. Let's get the holiday season done. Um, before I really start working on it. So I started working on this book. Uh, I think my first interview was, I think, January 3rd or 4th of 2019 was really the day that I consider I officially started working on this book. So it's been a little over two years in the making. Got it. And who was that interview? That interview was with Walt Davis. He was the director of maintenance and construction at Kings Island from 1978 until 1981. Two, and then he was director of park operations from 1982 to 1984. Uh, it was a really, it was a great interview. Um, he is such an underrated person in the history of Kings Island. The projects that he oversaw include the bat, the original bat, Viking Fury, King Cobra, Backwards Racer. And in fact, Winterfest was actually his 
idea. I mean, Winterfest is literally his invention. So it was great to interview him. And I give him a lot of credit because he was the first person I interviewed. And I had a blog that I had been putting some writings about King's Island. And that was really my like portfolio. So he right. took a chance on me just based off of that blog. I sent it to him and he's like, you know, this is well-written. It's very factual. So he took a chance on me and, uh, you know, the, the door opened from there. So it was awesome. Yeah. I'm very appreciative that he, uh, you know, just, I was a high school sophomore and yeah. he's like, yeah, he's like, come, you know, meet me here. Let's talk about this. I'm like, great. Uh-huh. So pretty incredible. I'm looking, I look through the, uh, kind of like the bibliography. And if you're looking, mm-hmm. if you're listening to this podcast, go to, uh, River Shore creative. There is a really good kind of write up summary of, um, Evan's book, but he's got a bibliography and the list of interviews. And again, I, I write for a theme park website and there's a lot of these names who I would kill to interview at any given time. And Evan is like a high school senior and sophomore through junior and has interviewed all these people, but he's got names on his list, like Dave Cobb and Walter Davis, who he mentioned and Rob Decker, Don Helbig is on there. Adam Hallis from GCI, Dick Kenzel, uh, GM, Michael Kuntz, Jason McClure from Cedar point. I mean, it just, it goes on and on. You've got Dennis, Spiegel, you've got Dudley Taft, you've got Gary Walks. Hey, you have Richard Zimmerman on here. Holy cow. You've got, you've literally talked to everybody you need to here. I mean, what was the process like in contacting these sources and being like, hey, I'm writing a book about King's Island. Do you want to talk to me? I mean, did you just kind of reach out out of the blue? Um, kind of. It was kind of a mixture of a lot of different things. Um, mm-hmm. When I started, you know, I did not have really any of these contacts. I mean, the, the the people I had, I had Adam House, who you mentioned, and Amy Steele, who was with Holovis. I had actually interviewed them for my Mystic Timbers uh, article mm-hmm. that I wrote when I was in middle school. And they gave me permission to use the quotes in the book. So that's why if you go through the bibliography, that's why those say 2017 was because I did those interviews back then. So mm-hmm. So when I actually started writing the book, I didn't really know anybody. So I just started looking up people's names, trying to find their emails. So Walt Davis, I found his email very quickly online, actually. And then he said, well, have you talked to Bill Price, who was the general manager who introduced the beast? I said, no, but I'd like to. And then, you know, so so that was a thing. Um, A lot of these people opened the doors for me, connected me. Um, But a lot of it was my own type of thing. There were a lot of people who were not responsive. So I had to, you know, keep kind of (laughs) pastoring them. Um, And finally, they agreed to be interviewed. Um, So that was a that was one of the most significant challenges of the book was getting everybody because there were people that I really, really wanted. And, you know, things happen. Rob Decker, for instance, I was supposed I contacted him pretty early on. He was still with Cedar Fair. At that time, this was uh, March 2019, and I had the interview scheduled uh, for March 14th, 2019. We had a date, we had a time set, and on that day, he retired. And since I had done all of our communication was over his Cedar Fair email, I didn't have any way to reach him because that did not work anymore. So that was somebody that I really wanted. You know, he through the email, seemed very excited about this project. He's been very instrumental in the park. So he was somebody that I really wanted and um, nothing, you know, again, you know, over a year went by uh, trying to find something you know, about him and there was no, no, nowhere to contact him. And eventually I was able to get in contact with Barry Hill, uh, my publisher. And that was one of the reasons why I got in contact with him in the first place was because I, I saw Rob Decker wrote his foreword. And so he was able to send me Rob Decker's email. And so I sent him an email message and uh, he finally responded in December of 2020. And so I'm really glad that I was able to interview him uh, before my deadline. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was just all sorts of things. And I mean, it lasted, the interview process lasted from January, 2019 until December, 2020. So. Wow. Yeah. So 40, 41 people altogether. Wow. It's, that's, that's nuts. And you mentioned Barry Hill, and Barry is the author of Imagineering American Dreamscape. Mm -hmm. Uh, We did a book book review 
on the website, uh, coach101.com, search uh, Barry Hill. You should be able to find that. But you mentioned to me when we were kind of talking offline that Barry was not your first publisher. So, is, yes. and then you, the, the uh, how did you get linked up with Barry? And how did you, what you told me was the version that is getting ready to be released on April 15th as a much better version of what you wanted to write. Kind of, I, I don't want to, I don't want you to throw any, anybody under the bus or burn mm -hmm. any bridges or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But what is the, what's the process like of getting a publisher and how did you find Barry and all those stories? Yeah. So just a bit of background about the first publisher. I'm not going to say their name. I don't like, I don't want to like That's throw funny. them under the bus or anything, but they have done a lot of books about amusement parks. And so they were, I reached out to them they read through it. They were like, yeah, you know, here's a contract. We're interested in this project. So I signed a contract with them for a May 2020 release, um, which I thought was perfect. I wanted to tie it in with Orion, King Sound's largest investment. So I thought it just made a lot of sense. Um, and then I got that book into them by their deadline. My deadline was March 1st, 2020 for a May release. And I was not really happy with that version from from March. There were a lot of people that I still really wanted to interview. There were a lot of people that I really wanted to interview. And there were a lot of holes. Um, only the first half of the book had been proofread. So the second half was just kind of, it was okay, but it wasn't, I was not happy with it. But I was like, it's a deadline, you know? And then COVID happened and the publisher was like, oh, well, we are going to push this back to late spring. So give you a little bit more time to work on it, which was great. I was able to proofread the rest of it. Uh, and I was able to interview Richard Zimmerman actually during that time. And I submitted the next edition to them uh, like May second or third, I think. And they were like, great. Uh, this is actually probably going to be midsummer. And then nothing, just radio silence. And then midsummer, they said, oh, it'll be late summer, radio silence. You know, I emailed them and they were like, oh, well, you'll have the finish. You'll have the proofread copy back from us uh, last week of August. And then the book is going to come out early September. I'm like, okay, that's, that's fine. And then all of August went by, didn't hear anything. And September 1st rolled around and I emailed them. I'm like, I have not heard anything. Like what is going on? Like what's the status? And they were like, oh, well, our books right now are not selling well at all. So we are tabling your project. So we don't even know if we're going to come back to it. We don't know if we're going to publish it. And I was devastated because I had a, I had a whole book written. You know, I had a contract signed. So I reached out to, I started reaching out to publishers like the next day because I'm like, I, I, I need this book to happen. Like this is something that is needed for Kings Island. I put a lot of work into it and I contacted Barry Hill because I saw he had written the book about regional theme parks mm -hmm. and I. I ordered the book and I was like, hey, I contacted him. I said, how did you contact Rob Decker? Um, but beyond that, what is your advice? I'm doing a book about the history of Kings Island and my publisher just pulled out at the last minute. What is your advice for finding a publisher? Barry said, well, I published this book myself. I have the resources to publish books. Send me the link to your PDF. I'll look over it and I will get back to you. And he looked over it. He really liked what he saw. And uh, it, it just, it snowballed from there. Um, the nice, the, the great thing about that is that he gave me an extra three months to work on it. So I was able to interview a ton of more people. I was able to get a lot of more uh, photographs as well. Ultimately, the book that's coming out right now is about a hundred more pages long than the initial copy. And additionally, I was able to use that time to get a cover designer on board. Uh, Paul Bonifield did the cover. If you're familiar with him, he's done great work with Cedar Fair Planning and Design. Um, he's done a lot of great work at Kings Island. And so I'm like, yeah, can you do the cover? He's like, I don't have the time right now. I'll give you some ideas. But he ended up carrying the cover through to completion. And he did a great job. 
So the book and just the layout of it is so much more professional looking than if it was the first publisher. So it, I mean, it's the difference is just night and day. It, it's so much better. It's cannot even begin to tell you how much better that this is. I mean, it's just on another level. That's awesome. And yeah, as, as we did mention, uh, Barry is, Barry is hopefully going to be a future guest on our podcast, but um, like, like Evan said, he did author the book, Imagineering American Dreamscape. If you haven't read it, it is a fantastic read about America's regional parks, uh, obviously, of which Kings Island is one. I do want to ask, you know, you had all these interviews and uh, it was, was it Gary Walks who wrote the foreword for Mm you? Yes. Yes. So for him to write your foreword and for, you know, Dennis Spiegel to Mm -hmm. have, you know, such a glowing comment on your, you know, on your book, what do those endorsements kind of mean to you? I mean, they mean so much to me. I cannot tell you. One of the best things to come out of this book is the relationships and the friendships that I've, I've built. You know, the people that I've interviewed have really taken this project to heart. Um, even, you know, Gary walks, you know, I interviewed him all the way back in January of 2019 and I still go out with him for coffee every couple months. Um, so it's just things like that. It's, it's, it, it's so meaningful to me that they said, you know, let's, you know, we want to help you out in any way possible. So yeah, Gary wrote the foreword. Um, he did a great job. It's a, it's a great for, I, it's, amazing. It's a great, great forward. Dennis Spiegel was kind enough to be one of our advanced readers. Um, so he kind of read through the book, trying to, we were trying to find kind of last minute changes. Um, and he was able to provide um, that quote to put on the website. It just means a lot to me. I mean, they fathered Kings Island. You know what I mean? I work. Um, International Street is just pure Gary Walks. I mean, that, I don't know how familiar you are with International Street, but Gary Walks went to Europe in 1963. um, And he loved it so much that when they were thinking about doing Kings Island, he said, you know, the entryway has to be Europe. And the countries represented on International Street are the countries that he visited in Europe. Uh, I work at Emporium, um, which is in the German building. So I, I work in one of his buildings. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just mind boggling and uh, it's just so great. And I, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate these friendships. It's just, it's amazing. It's one of the best, it's def- easily one of the best things that's, that's come out of this book. It's just, it's just been great. Awesome. What is kind of the, the structure of the book? Is it kind of like a timeline through history and talking to the, the people who were there at any given mm-hmm. time? Or is it, I mean, is there more of a structure like that or is it less kind of just kind of free flowing and just kind of recapping interviews that you had? No, it's it's the first one. This is this is the entire history of the park from its inception all the way up to the present day. So you begin with uh, the foreword and then we have a prologue, which is Coney Island. Uh, which preceded King's Island. And then from there, it just, it moves chronologically. It tells the story of the park, how it got started, how it's grown over the years, you know, why things happened like they did um, all the way up through the present day, which is something that not a lot of amusement park books do. A lot of amusement park books do not carry the book all the way through to the present day. I, I have a, a Cedar Point book and that book is advertised as the book's title is Cedar Point. Well, that book ends in 1965. It's like, what? They leave out 50 years of history. And with Kings Island, I mean, what I would consider, I I consider Kings Island as five signature rides, five signature coasters. Four of those five signature coasters were built within the last 12 years. So, you know, so that, so that was very important to me is to carry this book out all the way up through uh, the present day. Perfect. And, you know, obviously you had your interviews. Um, you've cited a lot of newspapers in your bibliography as well. What was the process like kind of curating this information? Obviously you're, you know, 18 years old. This is a lot of stuff that was happening, to put it frankly, before you were born. I mean, was it was you just <laughs> yeah. like pounding the uh, pages of the local library. I mean, what are you, how are you finding all of these articles and source material? Yeah, with the newspaper articles, I did go to some local libraries and historical societies, 
But the nice thing is that a lot of those, so the two Cincinnati newspapers, the Cincinnati Inquirer and the Cincinnati Post, those, those have actually been digitized. And if you have a Cincinnati public library card, it's, you go through their website and you have the, the entire archive and it's searchable. So I just search for Kings Island and I just, I, that was all the, the newspaper articles. But the thing with the newspaper articles is that most of the book is stuff from the interviews. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so that's, it's not just like, Kings Island opened in 1972 and then the beast opened in 1970. Like, it's not like that. It's, you know, it's, right. it's filled with flavor and character. Um, but the newspaper articles are very important because a lot of the date type things um, and also identifying people to interview too. Cause you know, people that were, you know, officials that were present at media days and you're like, okay, like I want to interview them. Walt Davis, for instance, I interviewed him. I was able to find him because there was an article that ran in, uh, the Western Star, which was the Lebanon paper, that's the county seat of Warren County. And that was at the Warren County Historical Society. And it was like a profile on him. And so that made it a lot easier to search for him and narrow <laughs> narrow the right Walt Davis down. Right. Okay. Again, never written a book. Mm-hmm. What is the like the the creative process like? I mean, how are you... How are you able to do this while managing, you know, your job at Kings Island, your schoolwork, your marching band? Like how much time were you putting into this book in any given day or week? I worked on this book. I have worked on this book every single day since 2019. There's no, there was no really like set time where it's like, okay, I'm going to set three hours away every day to write this book. Like, you know what I mean? It was more of like, okay, I have time today. I finished all my homework. Let's write more of this book. It was, it was more of that type of, of thing. Um, I mean, it was difficult, especially with marching band during band season, which lasts pretty much six months out of the year. Um, the Mason marching band is, we are nationally ranked, nationally renowned. So they're, they're pretty serious. So uh, that was, that was very difficult to, to balance it during my 19 and then 2020 seasons because I got the extra extra time to work on it. So yeah, it was difficult, but I I was able to find time. It just took a while. I mean, it took took two years. So well, what is something you hope that people take away most from your book when reading it? I, I hope people come away with a a better understanding of how the park and and why things have happened at the park over the years. I I hope people gain a a different appreciation for the park. Um, I I definitely want that. And I really want people to come away with an appreciation of the people, the people that have made Kings Island what it is. There are, there are so many people in this book, almost all of them have never had their stories told before at all. And their contributions to the park have been massive and their contributions to the industry. I mean, Walt Davis, like I said earlier, he invented Winterfest and nobody ever talks about him. You don't, you won't find him anywhere. I mean, the park is never like, he hasn't even been to the current incarnation of Winterfest because nobody at the park knows who he is. So it's like, it's just crazy stuff like that. Richard Fustner was Kings Island's first loss preventions director. Um, Unfortunately, he passed away about a month ago, but his, he was Kings Island safety director when the park opened. He wrote all of the park's safety policies and procedures. And a lot of those were adapted for use throughout the industry. He invented the fun and safety guide, which is an international standard at every museum park across the world. That was his invention. Nobody ever talks about that. Nobody ever talks about him. So I think that's something that I really want people to take away. I think a lot of people, when you think about Kings Island history, you think about Gary Walks, you think about Jeff Gramke, and rightly so, but there's a lot more people that have been instrumental in the park's history. Uh, Even people from other parks. Uh, Everybody associates Dick Kinzel and Rob Decker with Cedar Point, you know, rightfully so, but they also had a huge and lasting impact on Kings Island as well. So I really hope that people gain a newfound appreciation for both the park and the history of the park and the people that have made the history of the park. I love it. I want to go back to the people. You said, obviously, there's a lot Mm -hmm. of people in this book. Who, 
and I don't really want to put you on the spot. So if you'd rather not name names here, Mm -hmm. who are you most excited that you got to talk to, to put in the book? And then who were you most surprised that you were able to get some time with to put their quotes in the book? The person that I am, um, the per like the one the one that I can't wait for people to read, um, Gary walks, uh, because he is the father of Kings Island. Everything happened at Kings Island because Kings Island happened because of him. So I can't wait for people to read that. Um, and then thinking about the more recent times, um, Mike Kuntz, I've interviewed him three times actually. Um, because I started working on this book in January of 2019 and a lot has happened at the park since then, but his contributions about the Orion story and how the, the development of that ride, um, I'm not going to spoil anything, but people are really going to enjoy that section of the book a lot. Um, okay. The, the the interview that I was most surprised by uh, was Richard Zimmerman because that was not necessarily something I had planned. Um, like I said, I, I really wanted to interview him, but it just, it, it didn't work um, before the March 1st deadline, initial deadline. Um, Tim Fisher, who is the COO of Cedar Fair, uh, formerly the general manager of Kings Island, I interviewed him in January of 2020, and he was aware of my attempts to contact Richard Zimmerman. Um, in April uh, of 2020, uh, Tim Fisher said, give me a call. I want to talk to you about your book. I said, okay. Um, so I gave him a call, and he was like, hey, Evan, I hope you're doing well. I have a very special guest with me. It's Richard Zimmerman. So ask him anything you want to. So I was kind of put on the spot there, uh, but it it worked out great. So that was definitely the thing that I was most surprised with. And that was happening, you know, during the COVID lockdown. Um, It was a couple days before Kings Island was originally supposed to open. So I was, you know, that, that was not a good time for me. So I really appreciate that Tim Fisher and Richard Zimmerman really, you know, they just tried to surprise me and it's just something I'll always, always treasure. Perfect. What is, um, I like asking this question, especially of authors, what's something you've learned? And obviously you're a, you're a Kings Island aficionado, big, big mega fan. What is something you learned that you had no idea about prior to writing uh, your book? I think the planning process in general is really interesting I think a lot of people, a lot of people speculate about that, um, but a lot of people don't really understand it. Um, I didn't before I wrote this book. Right. And uh, um, what was the other thing? Yeah, there's just so many interesting tidbits and so many interesting stories about this park. You know, the story behind how Winterfest was founded. That's a that's an awesome story. Uh, the story behind Orion is really interesting and nobody you know this this is going to be the first time that that story is published um you know stuff like that um i'll tell you a quick little a sampling of of one one quick story from the book Uh, everybody always asks me about the brady bunch coming to king's island and i talk about that in the book uh in my opinion the more interesting little tidbit is from when the partridge family was at king's island when the Partridge family was at Kings Island the year before, uh, Dennis Spiegel was the assistant general manager at that time, and Taft Broadcasting owned Kings Island, and they owned Channel 12, which was a is a Cincinnati TV station. Um, Dennis Spiegel got a call one day from one of the guys at Local 12, or Channel 12. He said, hey, Dennis, he said, my son is a huge fan of the Partridge family. Can you take him around for the day at Kings Island, get him to meet the Partridge family, take him on all the rides? So Dennis Spiegel did, and this kid was running around and wreaking havoc with the Partridge family. Um, that kid was George Clooney. Oh, jeez. So, yeah. So, um, so that's just one one of those just 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 one of those interesting stories that makes the texture of the park, you know, it, it, you know what it is. And again, I think a lot of people are expecting this book to just be 
you know, the Beast opened in 1979, you know, the Racer opened in 1972. But, you know, it's very flavorful because it's the stories of why and how this all happened. So people are, people are real. I don't think a lot of people are expecting this book to be what it is. It's, it's 362 pages. I think a lot of people, when I tell them about this, they're expecting this to be like a little, you know, a little like passion project type thing. But I mean, this, you know, this is, this is a, this is a, an in-depth look at the park, but, but it's, it's, it's not so in-depth that this book is going to be sold to King's Island. So that one of my goals with this book was I wanted it to be as in-depth for the coaster enthusiasts, but at the same time, the general public are going to be buying and reading this book. So even if you've been to King's Island only once, you'll still understand everything that's talked about. So I, you know, I know that there are some people who really want like, you know, every single time a shingle was replaced in the park, but you can't tell a story out of that. It's not interesting, you know, for the average reader. So, so that was, that was something interesting while writing the book was walking that tightrope between, you know, I, I really like this quote, but you know, it's, it's a little bit too much, you know? So, so that was, you know, do I tell, you know, this happened in this year or the I leave it out, it's just going to make the book more cluttered. So that was an interesting challenge of writing it is trying to find that right balance. And I, I really want to stress that is, is that this is a book. Yes, it is 362 pages, but if you've ever been to King's Island, if you've only been to King's Island once, you'll understand everything that I've talked about in it. Got it. And you, you did briefly touch on uh, what was going to be my next question is if you had, um, if you had convinced your, your bosses in the merchandise department to uh, sell the book in the park. Yes, I, I have. We, uh, we just, uh, I just found out about that. It would be sold at the park on Thursday. Last Thursday was when I found out. So, which is great. It's exciting. So I'm going to be selling my book all summer long, which is great. But, but for anybody listening, if you, Kings Island is opening May 8th for season pass holders, if you can't wait until then, the book is available for pre-order online at a discounted rate. The book will be coming out April 15th. So if you can't wait until May 8th, you can pre-order it right now. Wonderful. And I mean, is, are we talking the traditional book channels here? Are we, you know, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, everywhere? Not yet, um, but right now it's off of the publisher's website. So it's rivershorecreative.com slash Kings Island. Got it. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you're working in the Emporium and somebody mm-hmm. has a book, are you going to be like, hey, do you want me to sign that for you? I'm Yeah, yeah, I'll be happy to. I mean, I have a pen at my workstation, so absolutely. While I've got you, I want to talk uh, some of your personal mm-hmm. Kings Island favorites. I mean, mm-hmm. really. Easy. I mean, yeah. it, it might be easy, might be difficult. What is your uh, favorite roller coaster, at Kings Island? My favorite roller coaster, at Kings Island, is Orion. That's easy. I mean, so, that's, it's, 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 yeah. It's been, what is it about Orion that um, you know distinguishes it from coasters like Banshee and Beast and Diamondback that makes it so much better for you? Um, I think it just has a really nice and varied collection of elements. Uh, I think it's a very dynamic uh, group of elements that they were able to get. Um, yeah, everyone does something different. It's you know, it's very dynamic. You have great airtime moments. You have great, you know, you have all you have great lateral moments. You have forceful moments. It's just a really, really nice package. Uh, the first drop is unbelievable. Um, you know, the speed hill is phenomenal. The final turn before the brakes is uh, awesome. Um, and, and that ride, you know, it is great theming, uh, great placement, in my opinion. That ride, you know, I was there at the announcement. I was there uh, at, for the first rider auction. Uh, I follow, I was actually one of the very last people to ride Firehawk. So I, I followed that project from its inception all the way to opening. So that was a really fun project. And then to be able to tell, to be the first to tell Orion's story, um, is very special as well. And this this may be way too niche of a question. Do you mm-hmm. have a favorite Easter egg that's in the Orion queue that references something else or another Cedar Fair attraction or another Kings Island attraction? My favorite Easter egg uh, is not in the queue. It's actually in the Flight of Fear exit, uh, the Flight of Fear photo booth. Um, there is a, so the whole, so that was actually one of the things, and I talk about this more in my book, but Orion's theming, this is another instance of, you know, COVID was a benefit in some ways, 
um, you know, it was a huge benefit to my book and it's a huge benefit to Orion because they were able to use those three extra months um, that the park was closed to add so much more theming than what was originally planned and adjust the theming that had already been installed. Um, so, I mean, the the Orion experience and Area 72 experience is so much better than what would have than than what was initially slated. And the photo booth was a part of that. That was that was one of the things that was just if Kings Island had opened as scheduled on April 11th, that would have been closed like like it has been for a while. Um, but they were able to use that time and, and add uh, a little vignette, um, a shadow box vignette in there. And um, it's you know, it. it tells a story um but my favorite little easter egg is actually on the bulletin board there is a photo of Dave Foki who was the vice president of maintenance and construction when Flight of Fear was built um and I was able to interview him so again that's just I, I again talking about you know I want the people people should be recognized for their work um and so it was really nice to see him you know now he's there for everybody to see on that bulletin board so um, I appreciated that. Dave Foki appreciated that. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that stuff like that. It, it means a lot to me because it, like I said, I mean, that's one of the points of the book is just recognizing the people that, that deserve the recognition. So got it. And then as far as uh, non coaster rides or attractions, uh, what is your favorite there? I like Windseeker a lot. Uh, I like the antique cars a lot. Um, that's another one that really, you know, means a lot to me bringing back, you know, Taft Broadcasting, you know, bringing back that ride, a Taft Broadcasting ride and bringing that back to the park. Um, I'm trying to think. The carousel, I love when the organ is working. (laughs) The organ has not worked for a couple seasons now, but it's a piece of art. Uh, 1926, Philadelphia Toboggan. It's a piece of art. I just wish that they had fixed the organ like they did at Cedar Point. Okay. And then um, favorite Kings Island food. And you you can answer blue ice cream here if you want to. No, my favorite Kings Island food is the brisket from Coney Barbecue. That's my favorite Kings Island food item. So, And then if you had one anything at Kings Island that you could consider kind of a hidden gem that not a lot of people think or know about, what would uh, what would your recommendation be? The best hidden gem at Kings Island is the patio behind the Miami River Brew House. Nobody really knows about it, and it's a really nice spot in the park. Uh, it's good food, and you get a beautiful view of Diamondback Splashdown. Wonderful. That's awesome. Well, mm-hmm. as Evan mentioned earlier, um, Kings Island, A Ride Through Time, is going to be released. Uh, it will be available online on April 15th. Mm-hmm. And um, Evan, if people are looking for you on social media or want to tell you good things about your book, uh, are you comfortable giving out your Twitter handle or wherever people yeah. can find you? Yeah, definitely. My Twitter handle is at E Ponstingle. So it's at E P O N S T I N G L E is my Twitter account. Perfect. So. Wonderful. Well, Evan, we really appreciate your time. I can't wait to read the book. Very much looking forward to it. And, you know, living in North Carolina, I am long overdue for a uh, trip back to Kings Island. I haven't been back in a couple of years. So hoping I can read the book first. So when mm-hmm. I go back to Kings Island, I can have a new appreciation for the park. And as you said, the uh, people who kind of made the park happen. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I can't wait for you to read the book. And I can't wait for you to ride Orion. It's an awesome ride. Well, there we go. I love it. I, that's the cell I need right there. So, yeah, right. You read you read the story of Orion, and then you ride Orion. So there it. you go. Well, that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Coaster 101 podcast. Thanks again, Evan, for his time. Uh, be sure to check us out. We are on social media everywhere. You can find the platform. We're at Coaster 101. Uh, also have a, a website, Coaster101.com. We've written articles about the Easter eggs of Orion. And, you know, we've interviewed Evan's publisher, Barry, about his book. Uh, we'll probably have an, an interview with Evan on the website soon as well, kind of based off this podcast interview. Um, Mm -hmm. If you got any questions, comments, concerns, fan mail, hate mail, or want to tell us uh, that blue ice cream is your favorite food at Kings Island, feel free (laughs) to shoot us an email at podcast at coaster101.com. Thanks, as always, to Justin Mabry of JM Music Design for our theme music. That'll be for this week. And we'll talk to you soon. See ya.